Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. In the last video, I introduced folks to the basic metrics in the bipolar junction transistor data sheet that the average experimenter would be interested in. Now, if you missed that one, you might want to take that in. I've put a link to it up in the corner for you. I'm continuing this series on the BJT here in this video by introducing you to the model that is at the core of basic transistor circuit analysis. I will present this model along with all of the assumptions that we make when we use this model. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, I'm going to begin by introducing you to the modes of operation of a BJT circuit so that the overall model will make sense to you. When we consider the operation of the bipolar junction transistor, we have to acknowledge three distinct modes of operation. These three modes are the cutoff region, the active region, and the saturation region. So let me briefly describe these three modes. Number one, the cutoff region. In the cutoff region, the base emitter junction is not forward biased. There is no current flow into the base of the transistor. Now that means that there is neither collector nor emitter current either. Number two, the active region. In the active region, the base emitter junction is forward biased. That means that there's current flowing into the base. The collector base junction is reverse biased. This means that the collector voltage is higher than the base voltage. And the collector current is directly controlled by the current in the base. This is also called the linear region of transistor operation. Third, saturation region. In the saturation region, the base emitter junction is forward biased. There is current flow into the base. But additionally, the base collector junction is also forward biased. This means that the collector voltage is lower than the base voltage. The collector current is at an absolute maximum. And you can't control the collector current by changing the current in the base. With these three modes of operation in mind, let's take a look at the model of our bipolar junction transistor. Well, this model of a BJT is the idealized view of transistor action. We make generalized assumptions about how the transistor acts in order to simplify the process of analysis. Here is a plot for an NPN transistor that we use for this model. It has the base current on the vertical axis and the base emitter voltage on the horizontal axis. Now let's start from the left. The base emitter junction is reverse biased. There's no current flowing into the base and therefore there is no collector current either. As we pass the base emitter voltage of zero volt, we move into the positive region. But there is still not sufficient amount of base emitter voltage to offset the effects of the space charge region of the base emitter PN junction. So again, there is no current flow into the base and therefore there is no current flow into the collector either. Up to this point, we have existed in the cutoff region of operation for our transistor. But eventually, we reach a point where the base emitter voltage is 0.7 volts. The space charge region of the base emitter junction has collapsed to the point where current begins to flow into the base. As a result, current also begins to flow into the collector. Notice that the base emitter voltage never increases beyond 0.7 volts. The assumption here is that this voltage never changes regardless of the amount of current we're driving into the base. Well, now that we have base current, we switch plots to this one. 
which shows the collector current on the vertical axis and the base current on the horizontal axis. As the base current increases, the collector current also increases linearly as dictated by this equation. The collector current is equal to the base current times beta. The assumption at this point is that the DC current gain, HFE or beta, is a singular number which is not changing with operating conditions. This dictates the slope of this line. This is our second operating mode, the active or linear region of operation. And this is where we want to live for linear amplifiers. Well, eventually we come to a place where the collector current can't increase any further. The collector voltage drops below the base voltage. It doesn't matter what the base current is, the collector current has reached its maximum and it isn't budging. It is at this point that the collector emitter voltage is at its minimum. And we generally assume for this model that this is 0.2 volts. Now in some cases, like with the 2N3055, you might want to take a look at the data sheet and use their number. Uh, for instance, it says 3 volts at 10 amps. But is that what the collector emitter voltage is going to be at 5 amps? Probably not. For that, you'd probably have to look at one of their graphs to get a better idea. We are now in the saturation mode of the transistor. We use this for switching, like turning on and off an LED or digital signaling. Now, if you're using a transistor in this region, it really doesn't benefit you to push more current into the base than is needed to achieve saturation. Doing so only increases the power dissipation of the transistor and slows down the turn off time when you release the input current. So how does this model compare to a real world transistor? Well, the first assumption of our model is that the base emitter voltage achieves 0.7 volts and stays there. Well, here's a graph of the base emitter voltage plotted against the base current. I made this using real world data procured from a real world transistor on my bench with the collector emitter voltage set at a fixed six volts. You can see here that the actual base emitter voltage ranged from about 0.61 volts to 0.71 volts, depending on the amount of current we applied to the base. Well, the second assumption is that the current gained in the transistor is a constant throughout its operating range. Well, here is a graph of the DC current gain, H sub Fe, as we vary the amount of collector current with a fixed collector emitter voltage of 6 volts. I made this with the same transistor that I used for the last plot. H sub Fe is on the vertical axis, collector current is on the horizontal axis. Notice that the DC current gain changes with collector current. It goes from 124.5 to 199.5 as the collector current increases. Notice too that it is not a linear change. Furthermore, there is the change due to collector emitter voltage. So here is a plot with H sub Fe on the vertical axis and collector emitter voltage on the horizontal axis. Once the collector emitter voltage is greater than the base emitter voltage, that is to say the collector base junction becomes reverse biased, it is pretty stable and what appears to be quite linear in change, but it is changing nonetheless. The DC current gain goes from 179.5 to 197.2 with a constant base current of 50 microamps. The third assumption is that there is a singular number for the DC current gain of a given transistor part number from a given manufacturer. For instance, all 2N3904 transistors have a DC current gain of 200. 
Well, when we look at the data sheet, we discover that they can have a DC current gain anywhere from 100 to 300 at a fixed collector current of 10 milliamps. That is a three-fold difference. So you ask, well, if real-world transistors are different than this model, well, then why do we use it? Well, to encompass every aspect of how real-world transistors act, we would have to dive into some very complex stuff. And we just don't want to do that, and frankly, we really don't have to. This model represents an approximation used to greatly simplify the process of analysis and design. You could say that it, well, gets us in the ballpark. Well, now we have the tools needed to do basic transistor circuit analysis. In the next video, I will be stepping through creating a design for a very basic common emitter transistor stage operating in the active mode. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.